That should be your example. You should show that to everybody. No, yeah. I'm not ever going to show that. This, this is what you need to read to anybody. <laughs> this exact video. I will lose my job. I almost lost my job that day. <laughs> Imagine if Hutch had been sitting in here. Uh, I, mean, I, would, I would have had to cut it off and be all mad like a like a grown up person. All right, so I uh, let's rock and roll. Respiratory system. Uh, let me just get through anatomy today. We'll talk about physiology tomorrow and get some other things. Um, for your breath holding activity that I have on Thursday, um, it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. It's just kind of a little quick assignment to do to take up some time, and it has a documentary that goes with it. It's about an hour long. Really interesting documentary. Um, I, for some reason, I get obsessed with certain things. Mountain climbing is one of them. Um, and for respiratory system, free diving has always been something that I am very obsessed with. Um, not that I would have any ability to do it, but just the, the people that are able to take the human body and push it to its absolute limits, even to the edge of death, I just am kind of astounded by it. Um, and, and there's a really good documentary on a specific accident in free diving that we'll check out called No Limits. Um, and so we'll start that probably second half of class today. And uh, it's only about an hour or so. If we don't finish it today, we'll definitely finish it tomorrow. And uh, probably have another movie we'll check out too that I really like. Um, so we're getting that time of year where we, uh, you know, start getting, look, seeking some input from you guys. And um, if you're at home and you have trouble finding some of these movies, let me know. Um, and we'll try to figure out a way to get them to you. Um, the one today is on YouTube, though, so it should be pretty straightforward for everybody. Okay, questions before we get started? All right, like I said, these notes are already up, only about a page of notes. Um, Officer Prince was, uh, was talking to me while I was typing these up, so if I made any mistakes, it's his fault. I already see that it's inferior to the tracheo. So, uh, yeah, I'll try to fix them as I go, but Maybe I didn't make that many mistakes, but yeah. All right, so why do we breathe? Something we talked about on the first day. We need oxygen. Why do we need oxygen? For your brain amongst many other things. Why, why, but why do you say that, Kaya? Just out of, just out of curiosity. Why, why, why is that one of your first things that you go to? We breathe to get oxygen for your brain. Well, I agree because you need your brain to be alive, but also I think that that, I think, did anybody else have an idea of maybe why she went there first? Cause you also need oxygen for your muscle and your skin and your pancreas and your stomach. Why do you think, I mean, I don't think anybody would disagree with Kaya going to brain first. I mean, you can still live with that brain. I see you want to say this before you get your brain in your life. Well, depends on your definition of life, but I, I, I'm with you. But no, 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 I hear you. No, no, I mean, we, brain death is a thing where you can have a, a body being kept alive with artificial means that is a living cellular organism, but without. I mean, like the baby was just moving and acting like a normal baby, but it had no brain. No cerebral. Okay. Just brain death. It really couldn't really do anything. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, but once again, I, I think that what Kaya might be getting at and what, what an interesting thing to kind of imagine is, you know, if we if we stop breathing, we stop delivering oxygen. The first place we're going to know it is our brain. Okay, so you're not really worried about. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can catch a cramp in your muscle, but we all know that muscles can work without oxygen. What do we call that? Yeah, anaerobic respiration, from lactic acid fermentation. We talked about that with the muscles. That's the burn that you feel is running out of oxygen. So it's not like they stop working. The difference is your nervous system, when it stops working, dies. And sometimes so much to an extent that it can never come back. Okay, that's why one of the things when people start talking about illicit drugs, and in the next few weeks, we might be talking about that a bit because we talk about ethical issues. Hello, whoever that is, that is, uh, we got Zach, we're doing anatomy now, bud. Um, but uh, but we'll talk about ethical issues. And one of the things we're going to talk about is, is illicit drug use. And I always tell people, you know, hey, man, be careful with illegal drugs. You know, marijuana is something that is illegal and can get you in trouble. Cocaine is something that can explode your heart. 
heroin is something that can shut off your heart, you know, all of these things. But I'll be honest with you, probably the thing that scares me the most, especially about young people and illicit drugs, is in, inhalants. You know, I'm huffing and like, um, you know, I had a friend, dumb, dumb friend, person I went to high school with, I wouldn't I mean friend, but person I went to high school with, who would put a rag over his face and spray, spray paint into his face and breathe it in. Okay, I mean, it, will it get you high? Absolutely. Will it make your brain dead? Absolutely. Okay, can you screw your brain up so much so that it will never recover? Absolutely. So I, I'm with you, Kaya, that your first thing that you go to is brain when it comes to oxygen, when it comes to breathing, because that's the first place you're gonna notice a loss of it, okay? So we get oxygen, we deliver it to our cells so that it keeps our cells alive, so that we're making ATP, so that our cells are doing what they're supposed to be doing, okay? Um, we talked about this question in uh, chemistry class today because we talked about percent yield. If I were to seal this room right now, snap my fingers, the walls come down, no air in, no air out, what would we die of? From? Wrong. Before we ran out of oxygen, something else would happen. But you're in the right system because that's what we're talking about. Our system is not working because there's no oxygen. That goes back to what Brian was saying. You, you're not going to die because of lack of oxygen. Something would happen in this room before the oxygen runs out that would kill us. But we're in the right world. So, there it is. You would not die from oxygen loss. You would die from too much carbon dioxide. Percent of percent in the air. What's the most common element? Nitrogen. Nitrogen by how much? 78. Yeah, 78, 80 percent. Second place. Water vapor. Nah, water vapor is fourth or fifth. Easy, it's easy. Second place, thank God, oxygen, okay? About 18 to 20%. Third place is argon. Nobody ever talked about it, why? Well, not, I mean, sure, nobody knows about it, but why don't, why don't we know about it? Why don't we talk about it? Very good, what does it do? Rock and roll. Y'all remember that from chemistry? Group 18, no gases, no reaction. So argon is the third most common thing in the atmosphere, but we don't want to talk about it because it's just there, okay? Then you get into water vapor, methane, and then very, very, very small percent, carbon dioxide. You start sealing this room up with, and don't let anything in or out. You don't die from loss of oxygen. You die from that 0.01% of carbon dioxide that's in this room right now becoming two, three, four percent carbon dioxide. We die from, from acidosis of not being able to dump the carbon dioxide from our lungs. So it wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to die, we wouldn't die from not being able to breathe in, breathe in oxygen. We would die from not being able to get rid of carbon dioxide, okay? And that's what we talk about it in chemistry class because you, where would you put humans where they are in a sealed container? Iron lung. Eh, sure. Iron lung works a little bit different. Iron lung is about more about pressure yeah. for your for your thing. Where where would you put humans? More than one human where they're in a big sealed container. No air in, no air out, except for what you put in and put out. The uh, what's it called rooms at the hospital? Is that what yeah, clean rooms at the hospital to some extent, but you really control that, and there's a whole lot of whole lot of ventilation. It's just really clean ventilation. I can think of two places you could go where you need to be in a completely sealed room to get there. None of us probably have ever done anything like that. A submarine. Or the other direction. An airplane. Higher. Yeah. Yeah, because the airplane still has ventilation. Yeah. I mean, a little bit, but still ventilation. Spaceship, submarine. Spaceships and submarines both have these things called carbon dioxide scrubbers. 
that uses uh, some type of iodine mixture. It brings air in and takes carbon dioxide out and turn, usually turns carbon dioxide into, re, into water that you can use to add to your, uh, your water collection because you need, you need water, obviously, to stay alive as well. But you got to get rid of that carbon dioxide. And so breathing is, you know, it seems really simple. We breathe in oxygen to stay alive. Bam, we're done. Let's wrap it up. But it's, it's so much more than that. We have to breathe in the oxygen. We have to dump out the carbon dioxide. And maintaining that balance is what allows life on Earth. One of the things we talk about in environmental science class is the Goldilocks zone. You know, Earth is the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold, just right. Not too much oxygen, not too little oxygen, just right. And that's what has, you know, allowed living things, life to flourish, but in, in the past million years or so, humans to flourish here on Earth. So let's rock on with this stuff with some anatomy. So we start off with getting the air in, your nose and sinuses. Now, obviously, we know that you can breathe by sealing up your nose, you can breathe through your mouth, but that's not ideal. That's not the purpose. You know, it's more that you just so happen to be able to breathe through your mouth, then that's the function of what's going on there. Um, it's that shared passageway once you get into the pharynx. That, that allows for that to happen. But your main breathing apparatus is your nose. Breathing in air through your nose, that air, your nose is set up to breathe in air better than your mouth is set up to breathe in air, okay? That's why when, when you're working out or something, they say in through your nose, out through your mouth, okay? Because when you breathe in through your nose, your nose has those structures that are gonna moisten the air, makes that air, have that water vapor in it makes the, the entire trip to your lungs a whole lot more comfortable. It's going to warm the air, makes it so it's not this shocking change once you get to your lungs. It's going to clean it up because you have all those hairs and bit structures in your nose to be able to get things out. And, you know, it also allows for olfactory receptors, which are doing what? Yes, the smell and help with taste a little bit. I'll agree with that. What crane on earth? Seven. Three. No, no, Two. no. One. One. Olfactory bulb sitting over the cribriform plate. Okay. Um, so you had the olfactory bulb sitting over the cribriform plate. That that cranial nerve number one that is is it's helping with smell. Not really going to say much more about that. The other interesting thing that your nose and your sinuses do for you is that resonance chamber for speech. You know, you don't think about it until you get a cold. When you get a cold, you start coughing really funny because you can't really going through your nose, then things get a little strange. It gives you that extra resonance chamber. You look at other mammals and even reptiles that have the large structures around their nasal cavities. Of the, you see the old dinosaur bones with the, with the big fin thing, kind of where its nose is. That allows that kind of trumpeting sound, that resonance chamber. You know, our sinuses aren't just at our nose. They go all around our face inside the different bones. We saw that with the cat when we split it open. You have those open spots in the bones. And that's what allows the, the sound to really resonate and change and be able to really give yourself a, a um, a powerful voice and, and provide that echoing. But yeah, external nose, mostly hyaline cartilage, a, little bit, a lot of elastic cartilage, but if you feel your pinna of your ear compared to your nose, it's not exactly the same, okay? Not exactly the same. The pinna of your ear is mostly elastic. The nose, external nose is mostly hyaline cartilage. It still has elastic fibers in it. That's why it bends back but nothing compared to that pinna that really just popped back to the exact same shape. And you also have that little bony extension. i get my stool back from Halloween. That little bony extension that is coming off that you can feel right there on the, the top of your nose. That is gonna be that protrusion that when somebody says they broke their nose, what they're saying is they cracked that protrusion, okay? They, and then somebody, if they really, really break their nose and, you know, crack it, crack and really screw that protrusion up, it can cause a deflection of the nose. It can cause the nose to, to be over to one side or the other. But, you know, we talked about this with the ear. 
having that floppiness on the nose is a good protection because you don't want it to crunch down and just not be able to read. You know, you want to have that flexibility to be able to get punched in the face and be okay. Where's the orbital bone? Orbital bone is just. Oh, I felt like that's okay. Yeah, orbital bone is is, is just is the name of the around the orbit. Yeah, the, the or, around the orbit. Okay. But um, so you have uh, external nose, then you have the paranasal sinuses. Paranasal sinuses just means sinuses beside the nasal cavity. Um, they're all over. There's the empty space between all of these different bones. The empty space between the in the frontal bone. The empty space in the maxillary bone, which is down there. The um, ethmoid bone, which is back here deep in the middle. Um, and then the sphenoid bone, which is also in the middle, kind of on the bottom. But it's empty space in all those bones. It's going to provide that warm air change so it's not so drastic when you breathe in and provide some mucus and some water vapor to uh, allow the air to not be so shocking when it goes in. Once the air gets in our body, we go to the pharynx. The pharynx is that common area for eating and breathing. You have the nasopharynx, which is the top part of your pharynx, which is only air, which is if you start talking too fast and you feel something start tickling your nose, or I remember uh, I was eating pizza one time, one time with somebody, and they started laughing too hard and they had a sausage come out their nose. That was the, you get that really uncomfortable feeling of food that's in your nasopharynx, or like somebody starts coughing and they, 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 or starts laughing and milk comes out of their nose, things like that. That is shooting, uh, shooting food up your nasopharynx, which isn't very comfortable because food and liquid aren't, you know, supposed to be there. The oropharynx is the shared part, kind of in the back of your throat, what we think of. And then down to the laryngopharynx is really leading into the larynx. Okay. Get down to the larynx, otherwise known as the voice box. We saw it pretty, pretty clearly on the cat. Um, voice box going to be, you know, right underneath your Adam's apple. Um, superior to the hyoid bone, inferior to the trachea. That should be trachea, not tracheo. Sorry about that. Let me go ahead and fix this. I don't forget. And it's maintains its bony to keep it open. It's bony to keep it open. It maintains that open airway and helps us produce sound. You have these tiny little muscles that, that you shoot air across these, these, these pieces of cartilage and different ways that they're vibrating is what allows us to do all of the insane sounds that we can make coming out for, for vocalization, for talking, for singing, for grunting, for humming, for all of these things come from the, um, the larynx. Thank God for the epiglottis. Epiglottis you saw with the cat because every time you swallow, the epiglottis is just this little cartilaginous muscular flap that flaps over your trachea so that when you swallow, no food or water goes down your windpipe. This is why you have to be careful about talking and eating at the same time because then you're confusing your epiglottis. And this is why you can get things that go down the wrong hole. That way, start coughing too much, having to get that water or food or whatever it is back up. And if you have a real problem and you get something stuck in there, you got your abdominal thrust or your Heimlich maneuver that just increases pressure here and tries to expel whatever it is out of the larynx. Hopefully it doesn't go past the larynx, but then you got a real problem. <clears throat> Valsalva, Valsalva maneuver is something that we all do and we not, we've never thought about what it's called unless you happen to be in a class like this. But it's what happens when you strain. When you strain to pick something up or when you strain to take a poop, whatever it is, you're performing a Valsalva maneuver. You're closing your epiglottis, you're flexing your abdominal muscles, you're increasing that abdominal pressure. Okay, What might be a problem from that? What might happen if you do that too much? What's up? Heart rate will go. Yeah, so you get your heart rate higher. But that's not the real scary thing. Straining muscle. You could strain a muscle. I could think of worse things then. Hemorrhoids are kind of a little version of a bigger problem that I'm trying to get to. Ernie. Heart rate will go up. 
hurt it. Pushing things out of the muscular wall. So you you have a this is why when you when you in a weight room, you put your weight belt on to add pressure here so that you can't push your intestines out through your muscular wall. Or if you're a guy down into your scrotum, which is absolutely something that can happen if you strain too hard. Okay. But that's bell salve maneuver, increasing in intra-abdominal pressure, rock and roll. Okay. Then we're past the larynx into the trachea. Trachea, one of the coolest things that, and I'm thank goodness uh, everybody who did that section saw the trachea because we had done that from the beginning. But the trachea is just one of the most interesting little parts of the body to me because it's the best of both worlds. It keeps everything open because you want to maintain that red way and you never want to let it flop closed. Like your esophagus. Esophagus can flop closed. Who cares? Okay, because you're not always trying to eat or drink. You always got to breathe. So we need that airway open all the time. It can never stand to flop closed or go closed for more than a second or two when you swallow. Okay. So it stays open, but it is not this bony opening like your vertebrae or your vertebral column. Because if you get punched in the neck, your trachea has the ability to kind of flop closed, take the blow, and then pop right back out. If you've ever played a sport or maybe you've been in a fight, heaven forbid, and you did get hit in the neck by something, you will feel this happening. You know, if you play tennis and you're lucky enough to never get hit by the neck, man, keep it up. But doggone if I haven't been hit in the neck. And you get this few second feeling of, wow, I'm never going to be able to breathe again. Because that what happens is, is your trachea just real quick, completely absorbs the blow and kind of flops closed, but then immediately pops back out. And so it comes right back and you're able to breathe, but you do get that your brain saying, wait just a second, something that's always open just closed, and we might not ever get to breathe again. Most of the time, that's what happens. It pops back open if you get a very, very violent blow where you damage those bands of dense irregular, or excuse me, dense regular connective tissue, right? Yeah, yeah dense regular connective tissue. If you damage those bands of dense regular connective tissue, then you got a real problem. What do I do? So I'm, I'm, I'm just come around the corner and Shamir is there and he has upset this girl, okay? He has upset this girl and she takes her purse and she hauls off and slams it up against the side of his head with the force that collapses his trachea. And he, like eventually, like most of the time somebody gets hit hard, bounces right back, they start breathing again. But I walk over to Shamir and he's got his eyes wide open. He's, his fingernails are turning blue. His lips are turning blue, and I can tell that his airway is compromised. What can I do? Trachea. That's pretty much it. Well, how would you do it? Well, punch in and uh, something else. Oh, isn't that the cartilage? Isn't that what it's called when you do the little cut? You know, cartilage, cartilage, and yeah. where it's drawn and rolling. Okay. Why ballpoint pen? It's going to ship on it and it's not going to break. I mean, you, would, you would break the ballpoint pen. You would break the, the inside out of the ballpoint pen. You wouldn't use the uh, pen. I was say, no, you wouldn't use the pen. Because it's hollow, yeah. A hollow ballpoint pen tube is really, really good. If you don't have that, the second best thing would be something to shape very similar. Would you say? I, said, I, think you said, I think you said straw. I'm with you on straw, but what type of straw? A metal straw. A metal straw, if you have one, but how many of those are around? A coffee straw. A stir oh, straw. Yeah. Okay, why would that be better than a milkshake straw? Okay, it's all about maintaining the pressure. If I take a big old milkshake straw and I shove it into Shamir's neck after I cut it open, what's going to happen to his lungs? They're going to collapse. The pressure in his lungs are going to completely collapse and he's going to be done. So you're going to use that pen tube or that coffee stir stirring straw and use that very tiny hole to deliver air because you want to keep the residual volume in the lungs. Make sense? Now, hey, 
don't do that. Call 911. But you know, sometimes I've seen a couple movies where it, where, where it worked. I've heard stories of it of it working where you talk about the tracheotomy stuff, but you need some type of knife to be able to get that, get through that skin and that connective tissue. And you need some type of tube that's very small, whether it's a, a pen tube or a coffee straw or something like that. And, and you could save somebody's life. You know, obviously, I think James is researching right now how to do it, right? Uh, no, I already knew how to do it. Oh, yeah, exactly. So, if, so if I get hit in the neck, I'll be okay. But I'm James, James is a paramedic. Right, so. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you for looking out for it, James. Um, <laughs> he's ready to go. Right now. All right. So we got that trachea there. Like I said, I'm a big fan of trachea. I, I like I like how it works, and I've always been impressed by it. I think it was it came from getting hit by the neck in tennis, and I've been curious of why that felt like that. But yeah. So once we get down to our trachea. Um, we didn't really get many dissections around the, the primary bronchi because we kind of rushed through getting the heart out. That's fine, I'm adding the lighting. But that trachea is going to split into two branches called primary bronchi, a primary bronchus would only be one of them. And then your bronchi are going to split into secondary bronchi. And then, of course, your bronchi are going to split into tertiary bronchi. And then eventually you hit your terminal bronchi. What does terminal mean? Terminal means the end, and then uh, those should definitely be alveolar ducts, not alveolar docks. Back on Officer Plunkin. Okay. Um, but yeah, so um, I always think of the lungs as kind of like an uh, air conditioning system. Next time you're in a, I wish that we, we, we had this, the roof was torn out here and we could see the vents of our air conditioning system because it really helps you understand lungs, okay? Um, you have when when the when the air first comes into a big room, the 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 tube holding the air is really really large, and as it splits off, the tube gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And by the time it reaches the other room, other side of the room, and hits that terminal point, it's going to have the smallest point because you don't want all of your air to go out the first hole. You want the air to be able to go on and continue to that hole. And that hole. And so the same thing happening in your lungs. You don't want all of the air to go to the very first spot that the bronchioles hit. You want the air to be equally distributed out through your entire lungs. And so that's why you get these little, you know, primary and then secondary and then tertiary, smaller and smaller tubes that allow the pressure to become equivalent. Then you get to your lungs. Lungs are pretty straightforward. These alveolar sacs that allow for gas exchange. What type of epithelium? Simple squamous. Simple squamous. Very, very thin cells, only one cell thick, because it's all about button those, um, those blood vessels, those capillaries, right up to the alveoli so that the gases can be exchanged. The hope is that this blood that's coming from the heart and the pulmonary system through the pulmonary arteries does not have much oxygen in it, but has a lot of carbon dioxide in it so that the carbon dioxide can go out because air does not have much carbon dioxide in it. And then oxygen goes in. So there's nothing like, we talked about a little bit, we talked about nerves, the sodium potassium pump. You have these, these proteins on your nerve cells that are, that are grabbing sodium particles and grabbing potassium particles and moving them more than they need to go. There's nothing grabbing oxygen particles. There's nothing that's taking oxygen particles out of the air and pulling it into your blood. It's all pressure. It's all pressure that's allowing that to do that. The reason we're able to breathe, the force of breathing has nothing to do with our body wanting oxygen. It has to do with our blood doesn't have oxygen and the air does. That's it. And the getting air into our lungs also has nothing to do with what we're doing. It's all about pressure. We're able to breathe on earth because there is a barometric atmospheric pressure. If you go into outer space and I spray you with oxygen, you can't breathe it because there's no pressure to get it into your lungs. If you're a fighter pilot and you want to breathe, 
you don't just deliver oxygen through your nose like you do in a hospital bed. You put a one on. What if, what if fighter pilots wear to get oxygen? The whole mask co covering your whole face, your nose, and your lips, and your mouth, because you have to create the artificial pressure. You can't just get the oxygen because you won't be able to get it in because there's no pressure. Okay, we'll talk about that more tomorrow. But you got the two circulations of the lungs, just like you have two circulations of the heart. You have the pulmonary network, which is the blood that's does deoxygenated, getting oxygen. Then you have the bronchial arteries, which is actually providing lung blood to the, the lung tissue and keeping it alive. You guys saw a little bit of the pleura, the coverings of the lung. The parietal pleura is that loose covering around the thoracic wall. And then the visceral pleura is right there on top of the lungs. When we dissected, we broke the parietal pleura. When you pulled the, 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 the rib cage off, you were actually breaking the parietal pleura at that point. Whereas the visceral pleura, we didn't mess with, unless you really dug into the lungs and started picking at the lungs, then you would break it, broken the visceral pleura. Questions? I have one. Go ahead. So back to the, uh, we were talking about someone gets hit really hard. So how come if you were to get hit in the back really hard and start breathing, it messes you up? Like getting your wind knocked out of you? Yeah. Let me make something up real quick. Is that a diaphragm? Because <laughs> I've had that happen before. Like, I hit my back really hard. I'm just like, my, my guess would be that it's a pressure change. Okay. That you're really you're really affecting. Like, what you're doing is you're – it's not that you're changing any mechanism of, of air movement. It's that you shocked your muscles so much that that you're, you're not having normal breath. That's That's – kind of playing off what Ryan's saying too, you know, is that it's more of a diaphragm thing, an intercostal muscle thing, and an accessory muscle thing than an lung thing. Okay. Any others? Y'all tired of hearing me talk? Want to check something different out? Yeah. Me too. All right. So way to stick with me, guys. And uh, we will be rocking and rolling with our documentary here.